welcome to Amplify the AIM podcast. My name is Jessica Levin and I'm with 7 Degrees Communications and today we are talking with Carrie Schott from Green Hass and Jenks. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. So today we're talking about something that is absolutely one of my favorite topics and that is uh, the integration of event marketing into your niche marketing strategy and from what I hear you do this better than anyone. <laughs> Thank you. That's very flattering. Um, it is something that we're really proud of, something we've been doing for the last three years. For the last three years. Wow. Do you want to talk a little bit and tell everyone about how it's evolved over the last three years, how you started and where you are today? Sure. Happy to do that. So a few years ago, we started a strategic planning process and decided to focus on three industry niches, food and beverage, nonprofit and entertainment. And um, using some experience I had at, at larger firms, uh, we wanted to develop compelling thought leadership to put out in the marketplace. And we wanted to build relationships with um, key referral sources and clients in those industries. And so three years ago, we embarked on our first industry niche event for food and beverage. Um, and I would actually say three and a half years ago, we embarked on that first attempt and failed <laughs> and then um, successfully uh, launched our first event about six months later. So, um, you know, I don't know how much you want me to tell you about kind of what we did for that event or it, how do you want me to dive into it? Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about um, the first event. And I think people are definitely interested in hearing about the failures because so often we fail and then our firms just don't let us repeat them. They say, well, it didn't work. We're not going to try that again. So I think there's a really important lesson to be told there. Excellent. Yeah, happy to share that story. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we find in doing these events um, is coming up with the right content that's compelling enough for people to attend. And then another one is finding the right speakers to deliver that message. For us, when we tried to do that first event, we thought we had um, content that would bring people to the event. Uh, we didn't create anything special for it. We didn't launch any surveys or do anything to create something robust. We just put a topic out there and we had all um, service provider panelists and we didn't really have one keynote speaker that was well known in the industry. So when we put out that first invitation, I think we had five RSVPs for that event. Um, and it was a very valuable lesson for us. What we realized is to be thought of as thought leaders in the marketplace, we really needed to come up with content that would draw good speakers. The speakers needed to be industry based, uh, our clients basically, or, or people that we'd want to have as clients, um, so that peers could see their peers speaking to them. So we went back to the drawing board and we launched our first survey, knowing that that content would drive some of that event content. Um, and it was wonderful. We had about, um, um, probably about 150 people attend our event. So it was definitely a sign that we had done the right things. And we had a keynote speaker that was uh, well known in the industry. He was CEO of a large uh, retailer in food and beverage. Uh, 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 Bristol Farms was the, the company. And uh, the, the panelists were very well regarded amongst their peers. Uh, at the time, we didn't get as many food and beverage companies as we did referral sources, but that's something that we've evolved over the last three years. Uh, happy to say we have about 70 people coming from about 50 food and beverage companies for this year's event on Tuesday. Wow, congratulations. That, that's that's yeah. very significant, especially since you had five people register for the first one. Yes, yes. Yeah, we're so, expecting about 200 total people. Wow, that, that sounds like a great event. Can you talk a little bit about the format of the event? Uh, the event itself is structured to combine networking with content. And so uh, we have an hour breakfast networking registration uh, at the beginning so people can mingle with their peers and with other service providers in the industry. And then uh, our practice leader kicks it off with an introduction after our managing partner welcomes everybody to the event. Uh, the keynote speaker speaks and does Q&A for about 30 minutes, and then we evolve into a panel discussion followed by Q&A from the audience. The total time is about four hours from beginning of registration to end of event, typically early morning. Okay, so you mentioned that your managing partner welcomes everybody. Is the firm involved in, in speaking in any other way, or are you really just the host who brings everyone together? 
It depends. Um, in some cases, we have our own practice leaders as panelists. Um, definitely our industry niche leaders open the event with an introduction, with an overview of the industry content that we plan to present. Um, usually that lasts about 15 minutes. Um, and in some cases, that practice leader is also the moderator for the panel discussion. Okay, wonderful. So you're getting some exposure without being the main attraction. Yes, we find that if we just put ourselves out there as the main attraction, that's not really a draw. Um, people want to hear from their peers. They want to hear from thought leaders in the industry beyond our firm, um, people that they can look to for best practices and to learn something. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's an important message. And I think it's something, did you have to convince your partners that um, it wasn't going to be all about them or were they on board with that from the beginning? No, I'm very fortunate to have very enlightened uh, partners who understand the importance of building relationships and um, sharing that spotlight in order to really come across as a true thought leader. Because being a thought leader isn't just about knowing everything. It's about knowing other people who can who can help and who can talk to you. Yeah, that's, that, that's an excellent point. And congratulations to you that you do have partners that understand that. <laughs> Well, they're good, yeah. <laughs> so I think something that everybody always wants to know is, how did you get butts in seats? How did you actually get 150 people to 200 to actually say yes? What was your marketing approach? You know, it's interesting. Um, I can tell you right from the get-go, mass emails only get you about a third of the way there, if, if that, maybe a quarter of the way there. Uh, what we have found to be most successful is, A, coming up with compelling content and compelling speakers. But then once we get that and we develop the branding and messaging around it, having our practice leaders and others call on people individually. So whether it's a phone call, an individual email, personalized email, um, that's been really key to our success. Um, another factor that I would add to that is um, involving other uh, service providers, attorneys, bankers, insurance, people who specialize in that industry niche, um, thought leaders in and of themselves, and getting them to reach out to their clients and the people that they know. And that that network is really critical to getting, getting the butts in the seats, as you said. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, so you get people there, you obviously did a survey to, to tee it up. Are you reusing the content um, that happens at the events for future marketing and communications? Absolutely. So the content that's developed out of our surveys is meant to have about a one-year shelf life. So we use that to come up with content for the main event. That's kind of the kickoff, the, um, the big uh, debut of that content. And then uh, we develop a white paper, which integrates uh, other third party research along with our own research um, and just some industry trends. And so we publish that and release that on the day of the event uh, that sits on our website, gets distributed through emails. Um, we deliver that when we sponsor industry related events or go to conferences, we'll hand those out. Um, in addition, we'll take nuggets of that and use that as content for our food and beverage newsletter that comes out quarterly. Uh, we'll expand on a topic that was covered. Um, our practice leader, uh, Don Snyder for food and beverage, for example, he hosts a number of industry related um, smaller group events. And we will break into some of those key content areas at those events and he'll present that content over and over. So it's really about creating presentation content. Um, the main event, the white paper, newsletter, topical uh, nuggets that we can put in there. And so, like I said, we design it to have about a one-year shelf life. Well, wow, that's great. So by the time the next year comes around, you're able to have fresh content. It is fresh content, and we purposely create um, a survey that focuses not only on benchmarking year-over-year -year content, but then also forward-thinking trend content so that we can have that combination because people want both, we find. They want to know what are the trends looking backwards and what are we seeing looking forward. Gotcha. Now, is this format, is this something that you're, I know you said you're running it for a few niches, you have a formula and you're, and you're using it consistently? We do. We launched it with food and beverage three years ago. We found it to be very successful. So then the following year, we did the same thing for entertainment. Uh, also getting about that time, we didn't have the failure. We, we went right in with a, a successful formula. So that, that helped. 
And then um, this year we did nonprofit for the first time. We did a longer conference style event. Uh, we didn't do the survey, but we just talked about that event that happened last week and decided that a survey is probably, we're going to probably use that same formula for nonprofit next year. Okay. So I, my, my next question was going to be like, what's next? Where do you see this evolving to? You know, it's very interesting. Um, I think for us, the evolution is getting more attendees who are the, the prospective clients and, and to also get our clients uh, in the seats because those are the people that we really want to reach. It's not that the other service providers aren't equally important in the relationship and in developing the niche, um, but it's really been about shifting of those 150 to 200 people you know, going from half of them being those prospects and clients to closer to 80 or 90 percent, um, because we find that that's that's really the audience. Again, it's all about lead generation. It's all about providing value to clients, um, being thought of as thought leaders to the people that we want to do business with. And of course, service providers play an important role. But I think that's the evolution is how do we get more companies in those seats? Uh, and this is these are free events. The firm is completely hosting them. We are. We did a nominal charge at our nonprofit event this year. Uh, we find that our attrition rate is a little bit higher with that audience. So we did a $25 nominal fee just as a way to sort of um, regulate attendance. Um, but in no way does that pay for the event. We, we certainly don't um, make money off of that. <laughs> Uh, in fact, most attendees didn't end up paying that charge, but just knowing that there was a charge added a value proposition to the event. So um, our attrition rate was actually significantly lower. I think it dropped from our average is usually about 30 to 35 percent for free events down to 15 percent for that event. So it definitely made a difference and something we'll consider probably for our future events in food and beverage and entertainment. Oh, that's great. So that's a really good, solid takeaway for people. Sure. So let me ask you this, right? So you're telling me that you're really successful. You've got these three niches. This sounds great. So I'm a marketer in an accounting firm and I'm listening to you saying, oh my gosh, this is a lot of work. How am I going to do this on top of everything else? Can you talk a little bit about your team, how big your team is, how big your firm is and the amount of time that was dedicated to this? Sure. That's an excellent question. It really does take a, a team to pull this off. Um, so I'm fortunate to have a wonderful marketing manager and marketing senior associate um, that work on my team. And uh, the firm has made a true investment in, in our marketing efforts. Um, we have about 130 total people, 13 partners. Um, so we're the 20th largest accounting firm in Los Angeles. Uh, so we are a decent size. However, um, there's no way that we could do all this just with our own internal resources. Um, there's a couple of different ways that we leverage other resources. Um, internally, for the day of the event, we actually work with the administrative support in those um, for those practice leaders, and they are just amazing, amazing people who want to get involved. Um, so uh, we usually have about two or three extra people day of the event who help us with things like registration, um, getting things coordinated, because that on-site support is so critical to have a smooth event. Um, and then the other part of it is the branding and the, and the pushing out the message. Um, we do not have a graphic designer in-house. Uh, we do use Catalyst Marketing. Uh, they've done a wonderful job supporting us. Uh, it isn't just a plug for them. They really have been a, a strategic partner for us to get materials. Uh, for, for example, the nonprofit event, we actually took it one step further and branded the event. Beyond branding our firm, we branded the event. And that was a big deal for us. We got a lot of compliments on that. So it's using outside resources strategically. It's using inside firm resources strategically to help with, with that. Um, and then I'd say one final thing we did, which people don't often think of is, you know, there are ebbs and flows in staff busy seasons. We actually were able to work with some of the audit staff who weren't assigned to engagements and they helped out. So people who had have an interest in building their careers and doing audit or tax and food and beverage, they're able to help with these events and really get a sense of what it means to market these events. So we've been really lucky to have um, people pull together for us and to have really good outside resources. Wow, that sounds that sounds great. I'm, I'm impressed. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, is there are there any final takeaways that you want people listening to know about to think about if they're thinking about an event marketing strategy? 
Yeah, I think there's probably a couple of key takeaways for success. I think one is um, don't try to do everything all at once. Uh, identifying maybe one industry niche that you feel like this could really work for. Um, and, and that's what we did. We certainly didn't go for all three niches at once to say, hey, let's do surveys and events for everybody all at once. Um, we, we fine tuned it. We, we made it work for one industry niche and then leveraged that year over year across the other industries. So um, I, I'm well known for saying the term baby steps. It's all about baby steps. Don't try to do it all at once. Um, I'd say another key to success is find that practice leader that has the most passion for that industry. Um, because in some cases, you might have several industry niches, but some leaders have a little more heart in it than others. So find that one where that practice leader just lives and breathes that industry because they're going to be the ones that that really push this forward. And we were fortunate, um, John Snyder with our food and beverage niche, um, just loves, loves leading the food and beverage niche. So that really helps. And then finally, um, don't be afraid to reach out to, to outside people, um, whether it's other service providers in the industry, whether it's outside marketing resources, just to, to get a sense of um, what can we do better. And we've done that a lot. And it's um, that feedback has been really instrumental in helping us do this. All right. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for your time. I think this has been really great. Um, we've got some solid takeaways. It sounds like your events are hugely successful. So I wish you all the best and I hope next year we can talk to you and you're going to have even more stories for us. And well, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you everyone for listening to Inklify. Listening, we're always aiming.